first of all, that I wanted to thank uh, Thomas Collier, uh, who is the person who produced this session. He's uh, been a, a, a loyal volunteer every year at the Battle of Ideas, and then he put forward to do this session, and we were really <coughs> pleased to have it put forward. Now, one of the things I wanted to stress, the way that Thomas had thought about it, um, was to not just do a for and against immigration discussion. Now, this is the Battle of Ideas, and we're not frightened of difficult arguments. But we are interested in not saying the same as everything else that you've ever heard ever before in your life. So we are interested in uh, thinking about uh, the issue of immigration from the point of view of who controls, uh, who comes in, who lives here, what the relationship with the EU is, whether we should say it doesn't matter and no one should control, those kind of questions, rather than the straightforward for and against immigration, which many of us are, uh, are familiar with. So, we've, you know, I know that that means that we've given our speakers an impossible task because it means that we're going to cover issues such as um, national sovereignty and it's going to uh, uh, look at um, issues around things like EU membership, no doubt that will come up, but also to go a bit conceptually about who would control. <coughs> so we just try and, uh, if I can appeal to you, uh, as I say, to just not repeat the same old, same old, but to just really work a bit harder and think a bit harder about the issue. We've got the panel on this question, really, the people who have uh, made a, 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 a important contributions to the debate. So I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll speak, and after I've introduced them all, then we'll um, actually uh, uh, hear their uh, provocations, and then we're just going to have lots and lots of conversation. So first up, who's going to speak is David Goodhart. David is Chair of uh, Devils' Advisory Group. He's the author of The British Dream, Successes and Failures of Post-War Immigration, obviously a hugely important book for this uh, discussion. He's also the founder and former editor of Prospect Magazine, which uh, he set up in 1997, is that? No. Uh, five. Five. Yeah, I can't read the right one again. And he remains its uh, uh, editor at large. Um, and anyone who's followed the debate on immigration will know that David's actually been central to maybe you could say, on the <coughs> leftish uh, circles, rethinking the whole issue of immigration. So whether you agree with him or you don't agree with him, I have to say that he was the one person who had some courage when he started this discussion to go against the crowd. And I think, in that sense, we're absolutely delighted he's here. Can we give him a, 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 a warm is Philippe Legray, who uh, people, if you come to the Battle of Ideas, will know uh, is a battle regular and he's hot-footed it from discussing pigs, as in <coughs> countries, rather than, anything, rather than the, uh, um, the farming session. Um, and uh, he's a critically acclaimed thinker, communicator, economist and writer. He's a visiting senior fellow at the LSE's European Institute. He's a former economic advisor to the president of the European Commission. He's the author of a number of, uh, uh, of books, uh, widely acclaimed books, but most recently, uh, European Spring, Why Our Econ Economies and Politics Are in a Mess and How to Put Them Right. Um, that's very important for the discussion we just discussed. Um, but he's also, and more pertinent for now, uh, the author of a book which I do love, which is Immigrants, Your Country Needs You, uh, Your Country Needs Them, which was shortlisted for the FT Business Book of the Year. And he's always speaks his mind. Can we give him a... a, a... <laughs> then we're going to hear from Stephen Wolfe. So Stephen is UKIP front bench spokesman on migration and financial affairs. Um, and to, to quote what his role is in, uh, for UKIP, he's developing an outward-looking, global welcoming, ethical migration policy for inclusion. And I think that's a useful thing to think about because it it means that we can at least go beyond the stereotypes. So I think the fact that that's what you're talking about doing and taking you at your word means that, and um, if, I, if you don't mind me saying this, Stephen, when, when I've told people, or when people have seen that we've got UKIP on the panel, they were outraged. And it seemed to me to be such a, a, a ridiculous way to approach this question, and from us at the Institute of Ideas, that we were gonna have this debate you were actually somebody you wanted to have a conversation with. So whether we agree or disagree, and that will, that will become clear, I think that's a, a, an antidote to any kind of like headline-grabbing uh, uh, caricatures, just your role. He's also the coordinator for Europe uh, for Europe and Freedom and Direct Democracy, the EF, 
GD group, I don't know what any of these means, on the Europeans yeah. Econ group. And, not anyway, just and I'm just going to say, <laughs> no, I'm going to say, I've, since I wrote that, I know it's all collapsed anyway, but we won't hold it. So let's give a warm welcome. Bruno Waterfield. Bruno is the Brussels correspondent for the Daily Telegraph and has been since 2006. He's been reporting on European affairs for 14 years, uh, first of all from Westminster before he went over to Brussels. He's the author of No Means No, a regular contributor to Spike, and he's one of the people who has helped us intellectually develop the work of the Institute of Ideas uh, for all the years we've existed. And I think he's spoken at every battle for the whole 10 years, so we're always glad to have him. Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay, right. Well, I will try and um, answer the exam question, follow what Claire said, and not talk about uh, the pros and antis of large scale immigration, nor the economics, nor even identity questions, which I think um, can lead to very long and cloudy discussions, but to talk about the politics of immigration. And I think the politics of immigration are best seen um, as one of the best examples of one of the fundamental tensions in our politics between the promise of citizenship, the promise of democratic citizenship, which is the promise of a degree of control over your destiny, a degree of control over your everyday life, which in practice often amounts to the ability to say no to things, to say no to a hospital closure, to say no to a motorway or a runway or whatever. Um, against that promise that is held out um, by modern democratic politics, we have um, the economics of prosperity, which requires us to relinquish control, uh, to relinquish control uh, <coughs> over, um, say, the factory we're working in is closed and moves to China. We're encouraged to believe that that is a good thing, as I think it probably may be a good thing for our wealth. Um, and possibly even accept the fact that the service sector job that we may then move to uh, will be one in which we have to come compete with East Europeans for. Um, all of these things, um, uh, all of this creates a tension between politics and economics, between what one might call the creation of wealth and democratic sovereignty. Um, and this is a genuine dilemma. I mean, both of these things are right in many ways, I think. Uh, but it is in this tension, I think, that populism emerges um, when the promise of democratic control is in conflict with the presumptions of so much of, of modern economics and therefore of modern politics too. Um, I think overlaid on this conflict um, is a more political conflict between two forms of liberalism, um, what I would call um, metropolitan liberalism or elite liberalism and kind of um, little guy liberalism, popular liberalism. Um, let me just very schematically describe what I think are some of the key differences. Um, metropolitan liberalism thinks that change is generally good. Um, globalization has disadvantages and creates losers, but these can be mitigated by wise policy, and there are generally more winners than losers. It believes in individual autonomy and self realization as the central goal of politics and perhaps even of life. Uh, it believes very much in social and geographical mobility. Um, few metropolitan liberals are full-blown cosmopolitans, as Philippe may be, um, but they do tend to favour wide and thin attachments and are often suspicious of group allegiances. Um, this kind of liberalism puts equality before fraternity in politics, were not necessarily income equality, economic equality, certainly not for, these, for those metropolitan liberals on the centre right anyway. Um, now against that, popular liberalism um, and I think it still is a form of liberalism. Most people that believe this also believe in all sorts of you know, the things that characterise modern liberalism, um, equal rights, minority rights, and so on. Um, but popular liberals believe that change is loss. Of course, not always the case. Modern world is better than the old world in most respects, but suspicion of change is perfectly rational for those who benefit from it the least. Popular liberalism places a very high value on security and stability in living arrangements and reciprocity in human relations. Um, popular liberals are moral particularists on the whole, meaning they value those close to them more than those who are distant. Fraternity puts fraternity before equality in politics. 
Now, um, our politics has been dominated by metropolitan liberals for the last um, generation or so, and I think they have paid insufficient regard to the, to the sentiments, to the intuitions of popular liberals, um, and hence uh, Stephen uh, represents a party that may affect, hugely affect the outcome of the next uh, election. Um, popular liberalism obviously has particular resonance in the um, in the area one might call the security and identity issues. Uh, obviously, it doesn't necessarily have particularly distinctive things to say about <coughs> regulating energy markets or whatever. Um, but immigration is very much a, an emblematic issue for this kind of liberalism. Um, unpopular liberals are believing in democratic sovereignty, perhaps more strongly than metropolitan liberals, um, believe that obviously immigration should be under national democratic control, <coughs> albeit acknowledging there are international treaties and international organisations, which the EU is one, that might uh, qualify that in some ways. Um, obviously, um, a country like Britain can't let everybody in, so you have to have uh, an immigration policy, you have to select on some basis, <coughs> besides uh, who does that selecting um, and who eventually comes in is obviously a central um, aspect, an existential aspect of democratic politics, particularly when you have immigration on the scale that we've had in, um, in recent years. And I think popular liberals, uh, and I agree with popular liberals, I think, I think immigration policy should res reflect our history and values. Um, our values are not obviously self-evident things and there is conflict over them. Uh, but we have national traditions, and that might well make one um, prefer more Commonwealth immigration and less European immigration. Countries like, I don't know, Slovakia, with whom we've had relatively little to do with historically. Um, we may, for example, want, um, depending on circumstances, something blows up like Syria, we may want more refugees for a short period of time uh, than some other category of immigrants, than students, say. Um, and we want the ability, the democratic ability, to uh, to be flexible on these things and to uh, to adapt as circumstances adapt one minute. Oh. Um, just um, coming up to the present um, in hopefully one one and a half minutes. Um, what's happened in the last few years? What we have seen is that actually governments are capable of controlling immigration. Contrary to what is often said, that it's just it's unstoppable flows. We have to accept a vastly unbalanced world in which you have all the ambitious and talented people from poorer countries and richer countries. That is just a fact of life. Well, actually, the government has shown that it can control. It's rather successfully reduced the levels of immigration in the areas it could control outside the EU. Now, that leaves, of course, uh, the EU. Um, and um, I think what is happening now um, in the politics of um, immigration in the European Union, we are, we are potentially paying the price for a rather dismissive view of metropolitan liberals towards popular liberals, and it's possible that we might even leave the European Union as a result of um, the open um, movement of people inside the EU, and I think that would be a mistake, uh, possibly even a tragedy for this country, um, but I do think it is possible to adjust, and I, I, mean, I think broadly speaking the government is right, freedom of movement is currently operating, I mean, Freedom of movement and the euro, the two big projects that the, uh, the European Union is currently struggling with, neither of which have worked out as intended. Um, and, and in both cases, um, because of the design that did not take into account national social contracts. Now, um, I think you can have free, a, a form of freedom of movement that does take, take more account of national social contracts. Um, I, I think actual physical controls are problematic in this area, but you can certainly have a system, and I think you could even win support for this in the European Union, in which you recognise the special rights of national citizens and that people from other European countries have to earn the right to aspects of welfare, labour market support, social housing and so on at the moment, because the principle um, of non-discrimination, essentially the principle that says you have to treat everybody, 500 million people in Europe as civil liberty citizens almost immediately, uh, which is a principle that virtually nobody in Europe agrees with. Um, but that, you know, just, just finishing, that, that principle uh, can and should be caveated. We should say that um, people can come to this country um, and on day one they can, they can get a job, 
uh, they, can, um, they can use public services, the NHS, schools, or whatever, but they cannot draw on the kind of the social acquis communitaire of this country until they've been here for, for say, two years. And I think that way you would at least deal with the fairness question. You might not actually change the scale of the flows very much, but you would, and you would make that acceptable. And you would give people a sense, going back to what I said right at the beginning, you would go, go back to that sense that people had some sort of democratic control and leverage over the situation. They, that what is their special rights as a national citizen were being protected in some way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, plenty on the table there, loads of things to discuss, actually very interestingly uh, uh, presented and worked through how you uh, looked at that question, so thank you very much for that. So, for links, your thoughts, please. The question we're asked is, who should control immigration? Uh, and my answer is, nobody. I think people should be allowed to move freely. Now, imagine for a second that you were born in a British village and you weren't allowed to live anywhere else. You'd have to go to local school, good or bad. You couldn't go to university, because there wouldn't be any. Your choice of job would be extremely limited, and so, of course, would be your choice of life partner. Now, you might think that this is a ridiculously extreme example, yeah. but in that case, you would still actually enjoy a higher living standard than most people across the world, you would still have free healthcare. Uh, you would still have uh, the expectation of, of living a long life. For most people in the world, actually, for example, someone uh, born uh, in an African village, uh, their life prospects, if they are forced to stay in the place where they are born, are much, much more limited uh, than that. In fact, you could be the most talented, the hardest working, most entrepreneurial, um, Best, best person ever, if you are stuck in a country which either has an unstable politics or few economic prospects, uh, you are likely to end up living a much worse life than someone who is born in Britain and doesn't lift a finger. Now, the world, contrary to that famous book, is anything but flat. And the way in which you make it less flat is you enable people to move. Now, <coughs> the objection to that is that if we allow people to move freely, that everyone would move uh, and that uh, society would collapse. <coughs> Except that's not the case. In the 19th century, there were no border controls. The British Foreign Secretary even said uh, that it was the official law of Great Britain uh, that anyone was allowed to come to this country uh, and society, not everyone moved and society did not collapse. More recently, we have the experiment uh, which has happened within the European Union. All 100 million people in Eastern Europe, poorer countries than our own, could move here. In fact, so could 10 million people in Greece, so could 10 million people in Portugal, so could 40 million plus Spaniards. And actually, we see that only a very small fraction of people have moved. Second, the argument is, well, everyone would move and they would stay. And actually, you find that most people who do move only move temporarily because they don't want to leave home uh, at all, let alone uh, forever. Uh, and so you see that when the border between the US and Mexico uh, was open, as it was uh, in the 1950s, that many Mexicans went to work to pick the harvest uh, in uh, the United States, and then they went back again. And the only time when you saw a large increase in permanent migration from Mexico to the United States was when the border, border started to be controlled. Likewise, there were no border controls. In fact, there was no visa regime at all uh, Spain until 1991, after it joined the EU, and likewise there was temporary migration from Moroccans uh, to uh, Spain, uh, but scarcely any uh, permanent settlement. And now, of course, we have another example, which is again in the EU, and you can see that actually uh, most people who move as a result of free movement um, are gone again very soon. Uh, most of the Polish people who have come to this country have already uh, left again. And the last argument is, well, society will collapse. Well, society simply hasn't collapsed with freedom of movement uh, over the past uh, 10 years within the European Union. Uh, and the gaps in living standards between, the, between uh, Romania and this country uh, are um, uh, substantial. And why has society not collapsed is because people coming to this country as immigrants are not charity cases. They are people with something uh, to contribute. 
uh, and uh, they contribute uh, in all sorts of ways. They contribute with their diverse uh, experiences and perspectives, which help spark new ideas. They contribute as entrepreneurs who start new businesses. Uh, they contribute by doing jobs that British people either no longer want to do uh, or are not able to do. Um, they contribute um, by paying taxes um, and by uh, helping to uh, alleviate uh, the problems that other would be faced uh, with an aging society. And crucially for a country such as ours with huge public debt, they help pay off a debt which was incurred to provide benefits for the existing population. So actually we should be really grateful that there are Polish people coming here who are paying taxes to pay off the debt which was incurred for, to, to benefit the existing population, who are going to work to help care for elderly people who often vote UKIP and resent them, um, who are going to help provide their pensions and work uh, to wipe their asses, which the British people don't want to do. It is absolutely fantastic that we have this freedom of movement. And this freedom of movement is not something which is only good for the poor, because you see that if you ask British people, and they're not keen on the European Union in general, what is the thing with which they most associate the European Union? And they say it is the right to move freely to be able to live, work, study, retire, something of which millions of British people take advantage. So my argument is very simple. People should be allowed to move, move freely, we should not be controlling uh, immigration, uh, and uh, insofar as the European Union allows that to happen within, within uh, the EU, that is a good thing, but it also ought to apply uh, more widely. Thank you. This is a no, it's not This is a safety announcement. Due to delays in clement weather, please take extra care while on the station. Surfaces may be slippery. Whenever I hear this, um, often when I arrive uh, back in Britain, um, <coughs> uh, King's Cross Saint Paul Crab. Um, it's read out in either the plummy tones of a nanny, who knows best, yeah. or the sort of leaden, bureaucratic, estuary English of plod in a visibility jacket. I know I'm back in my country, um, Britain. Um, and the real feeling I get when I hear those words is I don't really recognise my country anymore. There's a real sense today that the administration of our territory, the economy, the state, the places we live in communities, have our families and work, no longer really represent you or me or the majority of British people. Even worse, it's pretty clear that many upholders of the territorial order and their loudspeaker announcements, the public officials or high viz jacket wearing bossy stuff, don't actually hold us in high regard. I want to argue that the contemporary debate over immigration in Britain and other European countries such as France, Netherlands or Germany is the lightning rod um, for this sense of estrangement, this profound sense that our institutions, the legal and official order, are not for us. We no longer feel that our state looks after the interests of our people of the majority. In fact, we feel, we instinctively know, um, that it um, does not. There is a very, very strong, powerful sense among many of us, among many people who will know or have heard the conversations that people don't recognise their country anymore. I want to try and separate out some of the elements of the immigration to the debate to clarify what is and what isn't going on, because I, I think there are some dangers here. After all, all the mainstream political parties, Conservative, uh, and later, the people who have actually brought us to this place who universally agree um, that immigration is the cause um, of this uh, sense um, of estrangement. And I want to 
interrogate that a bit because it'd be tragic if uh, this uh, feeling that we don't recognize our country uh, anymore is manipulated to provide an alibi or an excuse for the misrule of man and mismanagement of our country over the last few decades. A few things I want to account for in this debate. <clears throat> One, I want to say it's not really about Britain's borders. It's more about the administration of Britain's territory, of the country. <coughs> Britain actually is unique um, pretty much in, in, in the European Union in the sense it does control its borders that can carry out uh, border checks uh, and counts and controls um, if it wishes. The European legal order especially is used as an excuse. What can we do? Our hands are tied. Um, and this excuse is used uh, for failures uh, to manage um, our uh, territory. I also would like to argue that there isn't actually really um, free movement. If you actually look at the existing legal order and, and what actually uh, happens, there are lots of different classes um, of people who are allowed to move from the sans-papier, who officially, 400 or 1,000 or so in Europe officially don't exist, many of whom are, 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 are die in the Mediterranean, um, to um, high-flying uh, Europeans uh, or uh, white uh, Americans. I think it's wrong to have different classes um, of immigrants. If immigration is a good thing, then all immigrants um, should be treated um, equally, and I think the European Union legal order is pernicious because it creates uh, different classes uh, of, of immigrants. Uh, Philippe spoke very movingly um, about the, uh, someone who, who, who might have grown up in an African uh, village uh, in Sudan. Of course, the European Union legal order uh, discriminates uh, against uh, such people. I also think we need to account for the fact that the planners, the bureaucrats, and the officials who run our country made the assumption 20 or 30 years ago that the population in Britain would fall. This was also tied in with other prejudices, often environmental, that too many people are a, a, a bad thing. We build less new houses in Britain than at any time uh, since 1851. That's why we often feel overcrowded or that our cities are bursting at the seams. That is mismanagement. Schools and public services should be able to meet extra demand, especially the count um, is kept, so we know what the population is, which is entirely within uh, the bounds of the legal order as it exists. Um, and after all, more workers, and almost all immigrants are part of working households, uh, more economic activity should increase the national wealth uh, to pay for it. If it isn't increasing the national wealth to pay for it, we should demand why. Immigration cannot be an alibi for the mismanagement of our territory. We also need to ask questions about the economy. Does the economy benefit the Commonwealth? Does growing national wealth work for us? Does immigration cause low wages? Wages are in secular demand, uh, de secular decline across the whole of Europe. Why? The economically, the response to the financial crisis plays a big part in that. The implementation of the uh, minimum wage has levelled down in certain sectors too over the last 15 years or so. The benefit system in Britain via tax credits subsidises low paying employers to the tune of £28 billion pounds a year. £28 billion pounds a year is paid to people on low wages, um, effectively subsidising a low wage economy. Workplace organisation is stigmatised by war, uh, law, and no political party pushes for a revival of real trade unions, such as we saw in the last uh, century. So we need a deeper discussion uh, about the economy, about solidarity. Above all, Britain's welfare state needs to be overhauled, not because of an EU legal order of European citizenship, but so it represents the duties and obligations we have to uh, we have to each other um, through our work uh, and communities. Voters should decide. Um, citizenship cannot be an abstract legal order, a matter of European uh, treaties. That has to be a question of, of democratic politics. And here I very much agree um, with David. There is a real problem with the misanthropic, anti-working class policies and prejudices of, of our country's elite, often justified as measures to preserve uh, cosmopolitan liberal values against the brutish instincts of the mob. 
The immigration debate can be an elitist excuse to restrict freedoms of speech, uh, for example, on the assumptions that it is dangerous. And look at the response to populism and the rise of parties uh, like uh, UKIP. And popular, this popular feeling of estrangement um, and this feeling that we don't recognise our country anymore is seen as pathological, demonic, uh, irrational and stupid. There is a very real culture war between two worlds. The metropolitan, university educated and highly mobile existence of a political establishment and managerial caste has little point of contact for the lives of most people who they scorn quite in an almost colonial way. For most people, the elite have fashioned the state into an order that is remote and culturally estranged, often predicated on mistrust of the public and infantilization of adults. The sense that I don't recognize my country anymore is an entirely legitimate basis for a new politics of solidarity and popular sovereignty, <coughs> but it has to be put on a sound footing. We have to talk about what the problem actually is and not allow ourselves to be deceived by the excuses and alibis um, that can lie behind the immigration debate. So I switched up the order a bit so it wouldn't just be like a sort of throw for and against. And in a way, that illustrated it. Somebody's arguing for uh, uh, immigration, but in a very different way than, than, than is, um, was argued before, and raising some different issues. So I'll really be looking forward to drawing that out in the discussion. So, Stephen, you give us your thoughts, please. Finish off. Uh, thank you, Clay. And thank you for the Battle of Ideas for inviting me today. The audience so far for not stringing me up and dragging me out uh, <laughs> down the street. I mean, I think when we're looking at the crowd, the crowded audience is coming out. I was kind of reminded of the joke that my brother um, recently said to me is that uh, there was a lawyer, a thief, and a teacher who all had an accident together in unfortunate circumstances. And on the way to the pearly gate, St. Peter stopped them and said, I'm sorry, you can only get in if you answer a question. And the teacher got the first question, a bit nervous, and St. Peter said to him, you can come in if you can tell me what the name of the famous ship was that hit an iceberg and sank. And the teacher went, thank you very much, I know that one. It's the Titanic. Okay, you can come in. And then the second person was the thief. And the thief was now really worried about it. And St. Peter said to him, I tell you what, if you can tell me how many uh, died in that, on that boat, then you can come in. He said, oh, thank goodness that I saw the movie, it's 1500. Yes, you can come in. And he then turned around to the lawyer and he said, you can come in if you can name them. <laughs> now, as, as, as a lawyer, I'm just, and also someone from UKIP, I'm wondering whether I'll be able to, to be in here in those circumstances. But for, for, for me, uh, it, the issue of migration or immigration obviously is quite personal and close to my heart. I, mean, I was born in Lost Side in Manchester. Uh, my family is made up of a black American who came over here during the Second World War. He was involved in a Jewish uh, lady who, who gave birth to my father. My mother was the product of an Irish Catholic from County Kildare and an English um, Anglican, I suppose. And what you get of obviously really interesting times at Christmas or Rosh Hashanah or whichever one you had. My mother divorced and then got involved in a Northern Ireland Protestant. So you can see that there's a whole lot of things that go on there. But what it was for myself growing up in the 80s as a young man, in a, 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 you know, what was regarded as one of the worst areas in the country during the Thatcher years, where there's something where I faced real racism, not the sort of fake racism that I've been you know, shouted at when I've been on audiences, when I've been called a coconut or an Oreo or a, a fake black in many of the stand up to UK and the hope not hate, that's what the names they've called me. Just because I propose uh, within the party a very different perspective on migration and immigration into this country. And it comes from really for me from part of my background when I really didn't have much in the house. We, we had to go to study for my A-levels at um, the Library of Manchester, and I don't know if many of you know, it's a really rather beautiful building. But outside that building, there is a cross. And on that cross, was uh, it, it, it's a celebration of people who died simply because they came together, men and women alike, two stages, one for men, one for women. But at least in those stages, they had a stage for women that were trying to bring themselves together. And that was the Peterloo Massacre. 
And at the Pizza Lid Massacre, within a couple of children, 15 people were killed, hundreds were injured simply because they asked for the vote. And we have had a history where people have been killed, 42 in Earthly Tiffle in around 1832, because they protested simply because they asked for the vote. From the New Model Army, to the Levellers, to the Chartists, and to the suffragettes around the court, not far from here, who were beaten by our own police simply for asking for the vote for women. And in 1969, we managed to achieve something fantastic in this country. We got universal suffrage for men and women alike at the age of 18. And that was the ability to be able to elect an MP who could make your choice for you, who would act on your interests, if you were concerned about health or education or your roads, if you wanted your infrastructure looked after, whether you wanted to go to war or not, at least you had the opportunity to vote within a small group of people, and the numbers are around 60,000 to 80,000 depending on your constituency, and you could get rid of them if they didn't do something that you wanted. But in 72, we handed that over to the European Union and we removed our laws and the majority of them to an unelected commission working with a council and having the ability of people like any like myself simply having the opportunity only to try and amend legislation where we can. For me, that democratic deficit was horrendous, heinous and an offence to all those who laid down their lives in order that we could have the vote in the first place. And that is the primary reason of why I joined UKIP. Because I believe that we have to have a country where the democratic deficit of the European Union <coughs> is removed and we bring it back to you in this audience. You may not like me, that's fine. I'm perfectly acceptable to that. But put it down in the ballot box here and make sure that I'm out. If you don't like us getting elected in 2015, that's great as well. I really welcome the fact that you have that opportunity. But the laws that are being made in this country are not in that way whatsoever. And so when people, and this is where I agree wholeheartedly with Bruno and of course David, is that there is a frustration in this country that when there are large numbers of issues that are impacting them, we've had a recession and a crisis, wages have gone down, our standards of incomes have declined, not necessarily in London, I've been here commuting and working for a long time. And sometimes I wonder when I come back to London whether you actually really do believe and understand the rest of the country that you're in. Whether you actually go to the streets of Salford that I do, you see the clothes doors and the people living in the streets or getting cars. It's nice words to be able to pick up the Guardian or the Independent or arguing against us. But it's fine when you're going off to your second homes or being able to get away for the weekend in Europe because these people can't. And you have a responsibility here to think about these. And when they're saying that immigration is an issue for you, I found in London that they've acted in the this, in this sense of the Gordon Brown with Rochdale. You've turned around and said to the lady, you're simply a bigot because you've raised the issue. And that is what's deeply concerning in the divide that's happens to this country. Because you've forgotten that outside of this country, outside of London, there are people who are genuinely struggling to make ends meet, who are generally trying to live a life with their families and make themselves on. You can either be like an, an, an editorial, guardian, uh, sorry, editorial Times writer and ignore those of Clacton, or you can get out of the bunker and start looking around and start thinking about the people that are in the rest of this country. And I'm here because, although immigration is not the main issue, it's part of the issue. And we have to consider that. And I'm not here to talk about the actual numbers. I know Pierre was doing so. I wanted to do, and we could have a different debate on that. But ultimately, if you want decisions made in your country, my belief is it should be down to you. You should be working together in a collaborative way to help the rest, rest, people of the rest of this country. It should be done by our own sovereignty, and not allowing those outside of this country to make those decisions for me. Believe me, agree with me, okay, that's your choice. But I'm here standing for democracy in my way, that I have parliamentarians make the decision and the people of this country decide who comes in or who doesn't. Thank you. Interrogate before I go out to the audience. Uh, first of all, I, I wouldn't make an assumption that this is the Conquer Elite. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them want to be, but um, <laughs> and, uh, the odd Guardian reader in, but you know. Um, but anyway, I'm going to ask you, Bruno, first. So let's just uh, clarify something. Since I've known you, you know, we I think probably we've discussed, and I and I thought uh, a lot of what Philippe said was 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 uh, spot on. That I am an open board. Sorry, I am an open board. Oh, I need to be. So used to shouting. So since I've known Bruno, 
I would consider myself to be an open borders person, although I have some qualms about the debate on immigration. But could you just clarify where you stand on that? Because Philippe made some very inspiring things about freedom of movement. Your references were not quite the same. Do you want to just clarify that a little? Uh, <clears throat> I, be I believe in freedom, and I, I, I think that freedom to move, um, to, to live and try and work uh, where, where you want to um, is, is uh, very important. And I think it's the sort of fundamental uh, human uh, instinct that has shaped uh, all periods of our uh, culture and history. What I'm trying to get at and look at is what the immigration uh, de debate uh, means uh, right now. Um, and I see it mainly and substantially uh, as being not really a debate um, about uh, freedom of movement. I don't think uh, freedom of movement really uh, properly um, exists. I think it is a discussion um, about accountability. It is a discussion um, about having um, institutions of order, um, institutions that govern your territory, that represent you, um, that look after their own people, you, the voters, um, and you uh, control them. I would sort of make a slight distinction <coughs> between you know, what I was saying uh, and what Stephen uh, was uh, saying in terms of the European Union. I think the European Union is used by um, our elite who joined it and shaped it and in many ways Brussels is as British as Whitehall um, because they like the idea of fencing off certain decisions away um, from voters. And so they say with immigration, look, yes, of course, immigration does mean we're going to hell in a handcuff, but there's nothing we or you um, can do about it. Now, I would dispute about why we may be going to, why, why there are um, certain uh, identified um, problems, but I would agree that it is very, very um, important um, that we are in control. We, the voter, um, are um, in control. And I think we need a new um, politics of popular uh, sovereignty, it's a case I've made uh, many times um, here, and we need a new politics of solidarity. And I see that a lot of the debate about immigration, which often actually isn't even really about immigrants, and we don't see the level of hatred that we saw in the 1980s towards black people or Polish uh, uh, people. I think a lot of the discussion um, is about accountability and who is in charge. Okay, and Philippe, I'm, I'm just going to turn to you. Uh, very quickly to say, um, on, on your arguments about free movement, can you appreciate the frustration of this lack of control? Because obviously you could say, um, for example, you, you, if, if it was a democratic mandate, you could have a democratic mandate to have open borders. I mean, it, that would be something that you could argue for and try and convince the people of Britain for, and I could, or whatever. But when, it, when it's an imposition that's not democratic or accountable, then is it not cheating for our side of the argument to kind of go, you know, is it kind of not cheating to just say we've got no choice about that? Well, I, I didn't argue about imposing anything. I argued no, no, but I, I'm, I'm saying do you understand why people are frustrated? Well, I don't <laughs> think I, I don't think that the decision to, to, to join the EU is an imposition. And I think they're a little referendum. Uh, and uh, the decision to allow people to be freely uh, was ratified by the British Parliament. Um, so you can disagree with that decision and there'll most likely be a referendum in which case you can vote to leave the EU. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't agree that it's been imposed and I'm not arguing that one should impose freedom of movement. I'm arguing that like in the 19th century, government should allow people to move freely. What I would like to know is because Stephen told us a really nice, interesting story, everything about immigration, except immigration. I mean, you know, his life story is very interesting, and I'm all in favour of talking about democracy, but what are your views on immigration? Because don't try and duck the issue because you think that people in the audience might not agree with you. Okay. Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll David, um, just on, on, on your points, um, I'm, uh, I'm just interested to know how you respond to some of the things that you've heard, because I actually do believe in free movement too. Um, can you see the benefits of free movement and freedom, uh, even though um, there might be qualms about... Yeah, yeah of course there are. I mean, there are benefits.
candidates from moderate movements, um, I mean, both general immigration and within the European Union. The point is, we have not had moderate movement. I mean, you know, you open borders, guys, uh, you, you think you're romantic. Um, uh, you are romantic. I mean, you, you are never going to get elected by anybody. Uh, this is just completely unrealistic nonsense. Um, and compared to the 19th century, I mean, Philippe, we now live in an era of mass transit. I mean, Paul Collier's book called Exodus about how very poor countries are being damaged by rich countries sucking out their, 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 their most ambitious and mobile people. Um, he thought that 40% of people in poorer countries would come to a rich country if they could, uh, and that doesn't seem to be an un unreasonable figure. I mean, of course, there would be huge upheavals, um, and, to say, and there have been huge upheavals in this country, in some parts of this country, after 2004. A million and a half East Europeans came to this country in a period of four years. It was the biggest um, movement of people in Europe outside of wartime. Um, and I am not saying, nobody sends them in this debate saying the freedom of movement should, should be suspended or should be stopped, but it needs to adapt in the light of experience. We, uh, freedom of movement has been there since 1957 in the Treaty of Rome, but it has constantly been negotiated and broadly speaking widened and widened and widened. So there is now no distinction in effect. Uh, you become a habitual resident when you've been here for a few weeks. Uh, so you get the full rights of citizenship almost immediately, and people think that is unfair and wrong. And if we cannot adapt that, if we cannot <coughs> respond to people's legitimate anxieties uh, about that, then we will regressively, I think, leave the European Union. Um, there has been, as a result of this movement, 20% of people in low-skilled jobs were born outside the country. Many of them come from Eastern Europe. Um, we. The system was not designed for a mass movement like that, a mass movement of people from poor countries. And it, you know, it massively interferes with national social contract, and we need to adapt in the light of experience. It shouldn't be that hard. Okay, Stephen, finally. I'm not, I'm not going to stop now. I'm not going to stop and be flat. Right, Stephen. Um, Stephen, are you ducking the issue? No, of course not. Of course not. The question here, the, the question you were raising was who should control it, and I thought that, that it should be the people of this country through a parliament here. But if you want, if, if you want to, loud. sorry, uh, when I'm speaking, I've been very, very loud. So, uh, but when we, we look at this, I mean, obviously Pierre talks about a go, kind of golden age of when we had open door migration in, the, say, the, the United States, which is true, it grew considerably. But once people start putting in welfare, the welfare state and the benefits of that, unfortunately you then start to have complications with that open door system. And indeed, every country in the world has recognised that. The United States put borders and controls in in the 1920s. And I think, you know, as, as David has said, it's a rather romantic ideal to have the, the view that we can all have freedom of movement. Lots of us can have freedom of movement, if, as many in this room will be, the ability to have a higher education, be able to travel with our jobs, etc. But actually the argument that we should have uncontrolled migration in any country has actually gone by the door a long time ago. What we argue then is UKIP is the principal position of having a managed migration system. But where we differ to the other three political parties, I'm afraid, is that I believe that we have to have a more ethical migration policy that actually treats the rest of the world as equal as those of Europeans. I do not see a distinction between a German doctor who happens to have the language skills and the ability and the capability to be able to repair my broken leg with that of an Indian doctor with the same skills. But we do have that in this country with the three political parties. They make it absolutely clear the German do doctor can walk through the door quite easily, without any visas or any applications, the same way that my county killed their grandmother can do. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm too offended by your small slight there, Pierre, on my background, all the way on my history. But actually, my, but, but my, but, but my black, American, my black American grandfather would actually, quick, 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 my quick, black quick, American quick. grandfather would have to have a visa. So UKIP's position is quite clear. Everybody in the world should be able to apply to come to this country equally and fairly. But they all apply in the same points-based system, and we believe that's the most fair system around. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's this lady here, but on the way, so can we start there, I think it's there, the microphone's away. Can we start there, then right at the back, um, there's somebody waving their arm around. Have we got two microphones yet? You, you first, then right at the back, then right at the front, yeah. Isn't the elephant in the room 
global disparities in wealth and resource allocation. You've got three billion people on, or whatever the statistics are on, two or three, three pounds a day. Um, and, and what we, you look at the, look what's happening in Libya and Syria, and the 40,000 people or so who've died in the Mediterranean Sea trying to get into fortress Europe. Well, I, 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 now I support something like open borders. I'm not sure what it looks like because I'm, I'm try, I try to be a realist. But what do we do about that? How how would open borders work in reality? Because I've seen I've seen some studies that suggest that actually there would be a trickle down effect, and people, northward migration would lead to repatriation of wealth, skills, shared values, and it would make it would be more, a more accurate reflection of the interconnectedness of mankind <coughs> and the common challenges we face in terms of. Um, ecology and global warming, which you could plant great on um, anyway, and that's going to lead to yet further displacements of people and yet further resurgent nationalisms within the EU. And it strikes me as a massively backward way of looking at the, the historic cooperation across the, the 32 member states in, in Europe. Are, do we really want to go backwards and how are we going to manage the migration from the south? Okay, so remember what we're going to do is I'm going to take about five or six questions, come up to the front, then go out. And one thing I'm not sure, so the, the session in the programme is due to finish at uh, 6.45. But because they're actually sending people in um, slowly into the drinks reception, we're just going to go run on for a five or seven minutes, just so that actually we're not kind of causing a major queue. So we've got a bit of time um, before we kind of go and have a drink. Yes, at the back. Well, I do like a, an immigration debate where it's difficult to actually get into the room. Um, I, I, um, I was interested in David's comment kicking off that um, he said, after this making some very interesting personal points, obviously a country like Britain can't let everyone in. Uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be possible. And it gets me to ask the question, um, because I thought Stephen made some really interesting points, and I was really... I uh, thought it's quite a compelling argument about uh, the need to have uh, sovereignty and to uh, hold people accountable and do all of those things. But it strikes me that we've got a sense of low uh, 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 horizons and very unambitious because it does go to the discussion about welfare and resources, but I think it goes to a discussion about the state and about capitalism and what we can expect. And, and to Bruno's point about solidarity, about what we can expect from one another and everyone in society. It seems like a lot of those old um, um, signposts have gone, and it's incumbent upon us to have a discussion about what we mean by creating value, uh, by having a dynamic economy and society, but not impose limits on the notion of resources or what we can uh, 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 have um, just finitely distributed to people if they're coming on our shores. But why not have a much bolder, more ambitious attitude to think that more people coming everywhere actually increases innovation uh, uh, and can benefit everybody and, and raise the bar. So as in the same way that you've got quite an ambitious attitude uh, about, about, um, about democracy, have that about what we can actually achieve with migration and, and therefore win the argument about no limits to borders. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this lady here. Yeah, I've got a question for the two romantics on the panel, um, Bruno and Philippe. Um, and that is, what do you feel about the um, situation that obtains at the moment where um, companies like Tesco advertise and recruit direct from countries like Slovakia and Poland and then pay the minimum wage and then have their workers subsidised? And all the kind of Polish nursing uh, agencies and that kind of thing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that lady there? Yeah. Um, Philip's argument seems to me a bit idealistic and simplistic. Um, you know, the examples that he gave border, without border controls back in the 30s, uh, what, what I want to point out, the world has moved on. Global landscape is very, very different now. You know, back in the 30s, uh, even without border control, a plane fare getting to the UK would be a big enough hurdle to put a majority of people off from immigrating to this country. But fast track to today, from an immigrant's point of view, if we were to look at the desirability of Britain relative to other countries, you know, if I were to migrate to the US or Canada, you know, they, they tax my worldwide assets and income. If I were to migrate to Australia, you know, there's a stronger correlation of Australian economy to Chinese economy. You know, UK is very, very desirable. I don't think without border control, uh, people will, 
you know, you won't get, um, you know, surplus flux of people coming into this country. And also, um, dare I say, I think we do need a um, selection process and a certain level of discrimination to ensure the fairness to the majority of the people in this country. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let, let, let me take this, this gentleman here, and then I'll grab some responses. Then I'll come back out. So you want to speak the next time, we've got to read that So thank you very much. And I, question for uh, Bruno and Philippe, I'm basically sympathetic with. Do you think that it helps the cause of freedom and open borders to recognise with David that there are duties of citizenship as well as rights? And if we agree that there are duties of citizenship as well as rights, don't we move the debate onto you know, a sensible place, which is what does democratic citizenship look like? And you know, it, shouldn't we, should, should, might we be able to convince David for a more open border position if we <coughs> occupy that space with him? Okay, thanks. Uh, David, do you think anything that you want? Not all of it, just quick, something quick. Um, I mean, I think trade and aid is the, is the response to the disparities in the world. The disparities in the world exploded in the 18th century, they're now narrowing again, and we can help that process through trade and aid, not, as I say, by sucking in all the best people from poor countries, it slows down their development, however romantic it sounds to us. I mean, I think when we've sort of touched on the, the, the infrastructure point on one or two occasions, I do think there's a sort of immigration infrastructure paradox. One of the reasons why people particularly want to come to this country is, well, there are all sorts of reasons. We have a relatively open labour market, uh, there are big diasporas from lots of communities, um, um, we speak English and so on. But one of the reasons they want to come is because it's a good society. One of the reasons it's a good society is that we have deeply embedded rights, we have the rule of the law, we have, you know, the people are not pushed around on the whole in this, in this country. Uh, we have due process everywhere. And it's precisely for that reason we cannot build the infrastructure fast enough to accommodate the people who come in when we have a system of mass immigration like we have now, which is why we end up with, with huge levels of congestion, favelas effectively in some of our big, big conurbations, you know, you know, dozens of people living in houses and so on. Um, the infrastructure problem is, is inherent in what is good about this country because people have the right to say they don't want the new housing development on their doorstep. And we have a legal system that allows that. So I do think there is a sort of, yeah, there is a sort of infrastructure paradox here that, that, that precisely because infrastructure is so hard to, well, well because people want to come here because we're, we're a good society, for that very reason we can't accommodate them. Okay, thank you very much. In the numbers that they're coming. Okay. Okay. Boy, then take a couple more, and then I'll come back just to Stephen and Bruno. So, yeah. I've rarely heard so much cant. The reason I laughed at Stephen's point is because the idea that the reason why um, UKIP objects to freedom of movement within the EU is because it cares about equality um, between migrants from within the EU and from elsewhere is laughable. The UKIP position is very simple. Whatever your problem is, it's due to immigration, and the solution is to leave the EU. It has nothing to do with concern with equality about Indians versus Germans. It's complete and utter nonsense. And likewise, I find it ludicrous that people will think that, that David's real objection to immigration is somehow because he cares about people in poor countries. Really, he cares so much about them that he wants them to deny them the opportunity to come here to better their lives. Yes. So look behind. Yes, undeniably true. Right, right. Fucking crap. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Undoubtedly, lots of people on the panel don't agree. Right, I'm serious. I know you don't agree. No, I know you don't agree, but we've got about 20 minutes to carry on and try to get more out of this than simply not listen. I don't know what the panel do. I want you to behave. Right. That gentleman there. These two ladies here, that gentleman there, for starters. There's more, what I'm just saying. Me? Uh, you, you. Oh, we've always got a mic, well, you yeah, first okay. then, and just then that gentleman point. there. Then. I'm just following on from what that Philippe point. said about Stephen and David. I mean, David's, you know, you consider yourself to be a, a quite political moderate, but believe immigration to be a problem, as do all of the three mainstream parties. So it, it makes you wonder what really the difference is 
of why there's the, the, the UKIP was seen as a kind of pariah party, really, because you know you all see immigration as a problem. Um, you know, is, what is it? What is that difference? And is it? I I, I suspect it's the it's the populist element. You know, it's because it kind of unleashes the you know the the people who are by the metropolitan elite are seen as you know a bunch of racists. Okay, thank you. Um, that gentleman there, <coughs> and that's all right. Just to point you're, on, you're coming in, so that's my reaction. Just to point on David's evidence, I'm going to fiddle in the footnotes if you don't mind. Um, you, you made quite a strong assertion that there was there was evidence that, that money doesn't get repatriated and there are no benefits from poor countries <laughs> going. Uh, you said pretty much pretty close that to that. Right. I'd just be interested in your evidence for that. Okay, fine. Footnotes might have to wait for another event. Right, there you go. He doesn't like footnotes. I have a question for Stephen. Can everyone just? Yes, I have a question for Stephen, which is a year from today, say if you get were to get in power, um, how would our day-to-day -day lives change specifically in relation to immigration? Yes. Okay, thank you. The lady sitting next to you, then, yeah. that, man? that man, then you sir, then I will come back to Stephen and then I'll come back to Bruce. Hello, my perception is that um, one of the issues about the UK, quite rightly, is it's a brilliant place to live. But surely the answer to that is work within the EU to make the rest of the EU a more fair and liberal and tolerant society so that we do, don't get these disastrous seeds at Calais. Yes, that gentleman. Me, yes. Okay. And this, uh, this one is addressed to Philip Graham. Le Graham. Um, six months ago, I watched something on one of the news programmes, I think it was Euro News or Al Jazeera, I can't remember. Um, a Dutch girl sits in a Dutch cafe outside drinking a cup of coffee in some Dutch town, and she says in English, I love multiculturalism. I look forward to the day when I'm a minority in my own country. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know from Philip whether he thinks that's okay, not okay, indifferent to it, and to give us his reasons, which would be most instructive. And remember, you've got a supportive audience, don't the hold back. Okay, thank you. The gentleman uh, there, and then... So, um, UKIP wants an ethical immigration policy. Well, uh, let's talk about what Nigel Farage said about people with living with HIV yes. today. Um, so, does UKIP think that if someone is a qualified engineer, one of these really great immigrants they talk about, but just so happens to be living with HIV, that they should be barred from entering the country? Okay, so, Stephen, you can't answer all of it. Well, I do appreciate you had some stick, so I would go at answering some of it. I do, I do want to say that, you know, when I say I haven't watched Question Time, and it turns into, uh, you know, all about you, kid, it's annoying. Um, I'm not prepared to let this happen here, right? They've got one voice, there's four people here, and they're interesting voices, so don't just, you know, it's not all oh, about you. Not. Yeah. Don't yeah. take it as an insult or passion, but answer as you will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, I'm sorry, Philip, for, for getting your name wrong. It's just uh, like written down across here. Um, to answer the question of whether we see immigration as a problem, we do not. And that never has been, and it's never been part of our policies to actually ever prevent or restrict immigration completely. Our policy has always been to about manage the numbers down to a level which we think is acceptable. And we're talking about 50,000 in terms of net employment. Uh, in terms of my recent policy statements on education, for example, I'd like to take education out of the migration num numbers and put them into a separate category because I think it's important to have those coming over from universities and students working here. And uh, we should be looking at a way of retaining some of those students after they finish their education for employment jobs. Uh, and, and, that, and that is part of the process. It's, uh, I'm sorry, Philip, if you think some, suddenly overnight that if UKIP got into power, we'd be actually closing the borders and kicking everybody out. That's never going to happen. It's not the case. And it's just a fallacy. And you only have to look at the, the, the members that we have that comes from a vast number of backgrounds. And as I said, last year, in, uh, sorry, uh, early on in, this, uh, in May of this year, when I held a, a big conference with a thousand UKIP supporters in London, and I put over 80 different candidates uh, fr from the different parts of the, the country. There were the Polish UKIP Supporters Association, the Anglo-Italian <coughs> Association, second generation, third generation, Pakistanis and Hindus. And as I said, we all got a variety of views. And we do have people in our party from different backgrounds. <coughs> On your question, sir, about uh, someone who has HIV coming into the country being barred, 
Unfortunately, the phraseology that Nigel used was actually taken slightly out of context. He was talking about more of a debate about whether those coming into this country should have to pay insurance or not to be able to do so. There was nothing about barring it, and actually it was qualified the next day by Douglas Carswell and equally ourselves. What we're simply saying is we're not here to try and bar people, but if you are coming here with an illness of any particular type that requires use from the NHS, then unfortunately we believe that you should be having your own private insurance to do so. Partly because there is a large substantial cost, as you know. It's not just the 20,000 that was mentioned in relation to the antiviral drugs. It's also to the secondary illnesses that go with that. So if you're going to try and have a, a national health service, we can't be there to afford the, 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 the global health service. But, but, but you're quite right that during the campaign, there was a certain tone, sometimes in, in the way that the, the, some of the leaflets I saw, which I opposed, uh, and actually also some of the uh, posters that were out there, which weren't, weren't the way that I would like to see them. When I took this role on from Nigel, I made it absolutely clear that I wasn't going to be the immigration spokesman, I was going to be the migration spokesman. And, that, and the reason for it is, as David says, and as that gentleman over there mentioned absolutely quite clearly, we have to look at the disparities of wealth between nations because it's going to rise, it keeps rising. And whilst there is a disparity of wealth between different countries, there's going to be a desire to leave those countries to come here. So we have to have more targeted aid and actually work without the barriers of tra you know, for trade so that we can work on that. Okay, so Bruno, a few more, and then final thoughts from everyone yeah, on the panel. So, uh, where are we? Oh, Bruno. I just want to make a couple of <clears throat> very uh, simple points. Yeah, I think people should have the freedom to, to, to uh, try and live and work um, elsewhere. I've had that freedom when I live and work um, in uh, Belgium. The funny thing is, why living and working in Belgium, being out of prison uh, for so long, I no longer have uh, the vote to write, uh, the vote, uh, the right to vote um, in Britain. If I want the right to vote in national elections, then I should become a Belgian. I'm living in, in Belgium. If I want to vote in national elections, I need to um, become um, a Belgian. There are some people in the EU who say that you should be able to um, sort of take your votes um, with you, that everyone should um, have a vote merely by living um, in a territory. There has always been a big um, distinction. Um, between the question of citizenship, between the question of having a vote um, which relies on you um, having entered into the duties and obligations of the people um, that live um, on um, that territory. Um, and the idea um, which some people in our lead think that the question of citizenship is out of bounds because of European um, Union treaties is factually um, incorrect quite um, uh, uh, frankly, and shows that they don't want a discussion um, about um, citizenship. And I think that the guy here who made the point about all the mainstream parties, apart from the Lib Dems, who are slightly more positive, all think um, immigration um, is a problem. What's the problem with UKIP? The problem with UKIP is UKIP is a popular response of people, of voters, who want themselves to be part of drawing up a new national uh, contract, who think that as voters and um, they should be the people to decide. And that's the problem with UKIP. It isn't that UKIP um, have views on immigration, because quite frankly, UKIP's views on immigration are uh, shared completely by many Conservatives and Labour people. Um, okay, thank you very much. So this lady here. Uh, I have a question to David. As you mentioned in your uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that um, you thought there should be some criteria for people entering the country or for people actually um, immigrating. And uh, I was wondering how you actually imagine these criteria to be set up, because in many countries they have, had, they have seen that it's actually very difficult to come up with one national interest, because maybe there is actually no such thing. Uh, and I would also like to hear your comment on uh, the idea with uh, trade and aid helping countries uh, because migration has so far often been seen to increase with development rather than opposite. Okay, thank you very much indeed. This, this, gentleman, this gentleman here said it's the lady at the back. Yeah. Just a few uh, practical points, uh, mainly for Philippe. But, uh, I run a housing association in Stoke on Trent. Last year, 38% of my new tenants are Polish. Uh, they are not going away. They're having kids, they're staying. They're bringing enormous benefits to the area because their children are doing really well at school. But I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say, well, it's okay because they go home anyway. They're not. The population's going up. And I think one last thing to say is that in many cases, the proof of ID is the £6,000 working families tax credit that these 
graduates and postgraduates who are driving buses in Stoke produce. So I think we need to have a proper debate with some facts behind it. Thank you very much indeed. The lady at the back and then, uh, quick, yes, and then we've got those two. The lady at the back. Yeah, we, we seem to have a democratic deficit, as people have mentioned, in the sense that the European Union isn't fully democratic, even though our uh, country, our government, have ratified certain things about it. And it'd be interesting to hear more details about that. That's disturbing. Uh, a second thing that's disturbing recently is that um, the Home Secretary has given royal prerogative powers to the police to seize passports at will. Now that uh, is using an anti-democratic uh, part of our constitution, uh, which doesn't require the consent of Parliament. And my question is to the panel, uh, can we really have a meaningful discussion about immigration while we are having these structures that are very anti-democratic controlling the debate and, and the legal and uh, actual movement of peoples at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. My question was actually very similar. I just, Stephen mentioned this term democratic deficit and I just wondered what all of the panel members, you know, if they could maybe talk a bit about that because it seems to me that if there wasn't such a hole at the heart of our democracy, numbers actually wouldn't matter. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the, yes, the person who's got the mic oh. back there and then okay. Um, Rana, you made that very nice point at the beginning saying that um, immigration is the lightning rod of estrangement. I think that's very true why we need to uh, open the debate and make it much more democratic. But it seems to me there is another aspect to it and that is the um, ideology of limits which has gone into this very much so. Um, Polly's, uh, Paul Polly's book was mentioned um, and he says immigration is in, uh, a selfish act. It's only selfish if you call people who want a better life and more and more goods, selfish. And in Switzerland, the whole campaign against immigration by the SVP has been organized under the motto, limitlessness is very bad for us, you know, saying. Uh, so, so this is another aspect, and I think breaking limits is also a democratic issue. Okay, thank you. Um, this gentleman, can I just see who else? That, that person there, yeah, yes. Um, I used to work in immigration. I'm Steve Moxon. The immigration was a quote from 10 years ago. Um, and I can tell you from working in there, our immigration system in no respect whatsoever works. The government haven't even got the vaguest clue, even to the nearest million, how many people are in this country. A conservative estimate, if you, if you go on the international comparison book, you factor in the special pull factors which multiply together in England, as David Goodhart pointed out about, we've got uh, a US style free labour market, but we've got an EU style uh, welfare system, uh, English obviously everybody's second language. Uh, a conservative estimate, the illegals here will be something like 3 million. Okay, so fine. nothing works. Then we've got the... the so, yeah, I'm, only, I'm just saying that's not swapping figures, because we're on the last bit and it'll come off any mood of <laughs> thinking or joy. Yes, yeah, where well, where's that thing? Where's that person? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I suppose um, I'll just like to bring back to... Um, is it a legit legitimate area of the government for the government to regulate? Because um, those on the... Um, uh, free movement side, I'm not sometimes not quite clear as to whether it's an argument that it, it, it's um, it's an infringement of the government and, and that uh, concept of 19th century laissez-faire kind of hints at that, or is it an idea that, um, or is the argument more driven by the idea that immigration is good um, economically? And in, in terms of um, uh, the idea that uh, if you were stuck in a village and you you're prevented from Moving well in, in the Middle Ages, that, that kind of happened through feudalism. It was actually your own authority that was stopping you from moving. And once you were able to move within the bounds of the state, which was in its time seen as a progressive um, thing, there were issues brought up about um, you know you, you you had to sort of go back to your parish for, for welfare relief and, and that kind of thing. So there are some sort of parallels in history there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd really like to thank the audience. Some great questions and the panel, um, I have to be forgiven for ignoring most of them, because they've now got to just give us a kind of thought to finish with. Um, but we have, you know, we will and should carry on this discussion informally and again and a lot more. So in reverse order, Stephen, just give us your final thought really, or uh, pulling out anything from that and sort of take away. Yeah, so the only thing I can try and say to take away is that we in UK believe that migration has benefits. We're not absolutist, where we say that it's 100% of all migrants create benefits. I think that's factually incorrect. But what we do believe is that we have to have 
in alignment with most countries in the world, a recognition that if we allowed our borders to be completely open to the whole world, then we would have substantial difficulties in being able to manage our economy, whether it's on infrastructure or education or health. <coughs> the question of whether our lives would change immediately on our is coming to power, of course it wouldn't change immediately because we'd have to manage that economy and we'd have to have negotiations with the European Union because in our second point, we believe that we have to have a more balanced and equal migration policy that looks at the talent across the whole of the globe. We actually believe that we should have everybody applying to come to the United Kingdom, as I said, but equally, on the same points-based system. I do not regard the European Union as a state or a race that should be treated any there differently to anywhere else. I think that equality has to be part of the argument completely. And once we get into a points-based system, then it's up to ourselves as a government and to also work with educational institutions and businesses to see what numbers we should be looking at each year, over what period, and how we look at that particular basis. We have to also consider a way that we can also balance those who have families here who might want to bring them in. We have to work at the fact that there has to be some sort of libertarianism, but I'm not an open-door libertarian like everybody else. I just want to have an equal place where people can vote for their own people, vote for their own their, their elected politicians, that they can get engaged in the process, and we will take the heat out of the immigration debate if we can hand it back to the people here in the United Kingdom with our own parliament, and then we have a points-based system based on talent and skills and looking at numbers that can be managed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think the debate um, about um, immigration is a debate about the, the long breakdown of any kind of national, social, political contract uh, based on citizenship that started in the 70s when we joined the EU, um, funnily enough, um, and continued apace uh, with Thatcher um, and Blair. I think it's very good to have um, that discussion. I think it's very good that that discussion um, is being uh, driven uh, by people outside um, of the elite or the caste um, that run uh, the state. I think it's a very, very positive thing. I think it's long, long um, overdue. I would hope that I would make my point uh, in that debate that I would not want to see a new social contract, um, a democratic notion of citizenship uh, emerge the damaged um, freedom. Um, that, that would be something um, I would be uh, quite um, strong on. I think we really need to separate out what often um, is going on here. This is a discussion essentially about not feeling we live in our own country anymore, that isn't driven necessarily by immigrants. It's not the fault of uh, Poles, um, it's the fault um, of a political elite that is no longer subject to accountability and control and um, by the voters, the citizens um, of that territory. I disagree. I think that opposition to immigration predates joining the EU. I mean, anyone who remembers the 50s or the 60s, I don't personally, but certainly from reading and watching uh, and, and talking to people, it's simply not true that opposition to immigration stems from joining the EU. It predates it. So any narrative that doesn't try and say that there was opposition to, doesn't explain why there was opposition to, opposition to immigration before then, isn't probably that convincing. Um, in terms of, I think I've kind of given the wrong impression that somehow I see uh, open borders as a return to the past. I think, on the contrary, open borders are a window to the future. And the beautiful thing is we've had an experiment of, of how they might work over uh, the past decade uh, in the European Union. And, and many of the fears um, that are peddled by uh, critics of immigration and opponents of open borders more generally um, have been confounded. And that's the crucial point. In a modern world, uh, with a welfare system, with a tax system, I mean, just to give you the, the, the welfare point, which is so often made, three countries opened up um, <coughs> to East Europeans in 2004. Britain and Ireland, which don't have generous welfare systems and didn't offer access to welfare be benefits immediately, and Sweden, which has the most generous welfare system uh, on the planet, probably. 
So did Polish people all go to Sweden to claim welfare? No, they didn't. 99% of those who migrated went to Britain and Ireland overwhelmingly to work. So the notion that people are all going to come here and claim welfare is just simply not true. So, sorry? No, not you, Sean. Sean. <laughs> and my, fi my final point is, is, is the, the point which was very important made by the gentleman at the back about feudalism. If you think about it, the system we have now uh, consists of a global apartheid. Some people, like in a feudal world, are tied to the land where they are born, and other people, more privileged people like myself and David, can move more or less freely. And I think that system of global apartheid is morally abhorrent. And so, do we want to say we want to move back to feudalism, or do we want to say no, we want to move forward to a future where everyone can enjoy uh, the, the rights that I enjoy and to be able to move more or less freely? And I want to move forward to that kind of future. Thank you. redistribution of wealth between regions, between classes, between generations. All of these things only happen substantially at the level of the nation state. And if large scale migration <coughs> continues at the sort of levels we're seeing now, if we, if we don't get a proper response from the European Union to the legitimate <coughs> complaints, then, um, then I fear in the long run some of those things will be eroded, and in the short run we will unnecessarily leave the European Union. I just want to say uh, thank you very much to the panel. I mean, it, it is a, a, an issue which is hard to debate. And we've discussed uh, immigration, we've had a debate on immigration in the past of the Battle of Ideas, and it was horrible in as much as it, it, it just became a caricature of itself. And everybody kind of shouting racist or, you know, or whatever, which is right. It was really unpleasant. And I kind of almost vowed not to discuss it again, even, even though I think it's key. I do want to commend the speakers who might have uh, got a bit snarly with each other, however, for actually raising the intellectual level of the debate more generally on this topic in this country, honestly, and that's not to flatter them uh, easily, just because I, actually thought, no, because I just thought that they did, and they all rose to that challenge. And also to the audience for, uh, you know, not, not kind of playing the, the, the usual games that happen in this debate. This is an incredibly important discussion, both in terms of economy at the end, in terms of the welfare state, in terms of democracy, in terms of what we do in relation to Europe in the future, in terms of how seriously we take ourselves and how seriously we take ourselves as people who are capable of uh, having a political discussion. If this political discussion is hijacked by people who are willing to allow it to be a proper debate, we'll get nowhere. But if we actually listen to each other and think about it, we might get somewhere, wherever you go on it. Um, I'm still proud to be an idealist, but I also think that there's a huge amount to be said for some of the arguments against a position I've held all my, life, uh, all my adult life in terms of open borders, because I do think democ democracy is challenged and contempt is shown to populist parties, which I find um, uh, contempt with. So that's uh, my view. Um, if you haven't read Philippe's book, you must read it. Um, I find it inspiring. Too many numbers for me as an economist. 
uh, but definitely worth taking on board and thinking about the arguments for open borders. If you haven't read David's book, you must read it because it's forget the footnotes. Like, there's so many rounds about footnotes in David's book, I can't tell you. Ignore the figures, they're probably all wrong. Don't say anything. They are don't, wrong. don't react. Don't react. The point is, there's an argument in there. And what's interesting is the argument, not the figures. Don't read Bruno's books or Stephen's books. Read their manifesto. Read the Telegraph. Well, actually, when he's in it. Um, come and talk to them afterwards. Now, thanks to SMB Villa, we can all go and have a drink and argue intelligently about this debate. Enjoy the rest of the well, the price of it in this country already is, is families that are being broken apart because the non-EU spouse that doesn't earn 18,600 a year. What's more dehumanising than breaking up a family because of an abstract commitment to a... It's just... There's a paradox about democracy and what democracy is because it's a very hard position to... It's a, it's a, it's a kind of sort of nuanced compassion and it's an internationalist position and how do you mean that argument against this sort of around this? It's always going to be more popular we should look after our own. We haven't got enough. I was at a table with a Belgian lady, a single mother, talking about immigration and she started crying, clearly overwhelmed by her domestic circumstances and her economic insecurity. I can't look after my own family. Why are these people coming here and they can't? And it's on that level. And I find...